Silicon transistors face structural limitations at the nanoscale. However, by incorporating carbon nanotube field effect transistors as an alternative, computer processing speeds can continue to increase. When a high voltage is introduced into a vacuum tube, the electrons flow from the negatively charged metal cathode on one end to the positively charged metal anode on the other end. This is the idea behind a transistor. Transistors and vacuum tubes are both three terminal devices. This means that there are two terminals that the current flows between and a third terminal that controls the current with a smaller voltage. In a bipolar transistor, current flows between emitter and collector. In a vacuum tube, current flows between anode and cathode. The additional voltage in a bipolar transistor is the base voltage. Vacuum tubes were actually used before the modern day use of silicon and germanium. Silicon is an insulator in its amorphous state, and germanium is an insulator in its pure state. However, when impurities are introduced through a method called doping, germanium becomes a weak conductor or a semiconductor. After an electron moves across the band of conduction, a hole is left in its place for another electron to fill. This creates a flow of holes moving in one direction and electrons moving in the other direction. Depending on what elements are used during doping, the material becomes negative type or N-type and positive type, P-type. Like the vacuum tube, electrons flow from negative to positive. Electrons flow away from the N-type layer and towards the P-type layer, creating a flow of electrons. By alternating these positive and negative layers, the electrical currents can be amplified. They can be arranged in a PNP arrangement or an NPN arrangement. When a voltage or current of electrons is introduced to the base emitter junction, the electrons diffuse from the area of high concentration to low concentration. They flow from the emitter to the base towards the collector. Over the years, the main focus of research in the field of transistors has been focused on increasing the density of transistors in order to decrease their size. This allows for more and more transistors to be packed into processing chips, allowing for faster and more powerful computers. Scientists in the field have long subscribed to the prediction of Gordon Moore, co-founder of Intel Corp, that the number of transistors per chip will double approximately every 18 months, therefore causing computer power to double. Since the invention of the transistor, this prediction, known as Moore's Law, has generally held true. This is evidenced by the graph of transistors per chip over time within Intel's processors. Although up to this point it has been possible to decrease the size of transistors, this will eventually be impossible, as there is a limit to how small transistors can be, and most likely a limit to how small transistors can be produced, even if they can theoretically be smaller. Also, as the size of transistors decreases, they lose efficiency, since it will eventually become impossible to increase computer power simply by decreasing the size of semiconductor transistors. It will be necessary to find a way to increase computing power when it is impossible to pack more transistors into processing chips. This breakdown of Moore's Law could also occur from economic and physical limitations, such as the production of transistors. Because silicon transistors can only get so small, scientists are researching the possibility of using carbon nanotubes as field effect transistors. As silicon transistors reach a size of about 10 to 20 nanometers, they approach a thermodynamic limit and experience quantum tunneling. When the thermodynamic limit is reached and exceeded, transistors incorrectly store and register data. Further, quantum tunneling causes excessive heat and power dissipation because at the nanoscale, electrons can pass through walls, as they do with the silicon substrate that separates the transistor's terminals. Carbon nanotube transistors provide a more efficient and effective alternative. Carbon nanotubes are generally made from arc discharge or chemical vapor deposition. Arc discharge produces carbon nanotubes by applying a current across a graphite, anode, and cathode placed about one millimeter apart. The nanotubes are found in the dust and soot produced by the reaction. Chemical vapor deposition produces hydrocarbon vapor with a metal catalyst. Carbon nanotubes grow off of the metal catalyst substrate in the reaction, which can be in any phase. Based on how the nanotubes are produced, defects and inconsistencies may result, which limit thermal conduction and energy efficiency. The structure of the carbon nanotubes can be visualized by imagining graphene sheets, rolled into hollow cylinders 2,000 times thinner than human hair. As we know, this is not how carbon nanotubes are actually produced. The structure appears similar to that of chicken wire. Atomic force microscopes are used to modify the nanotubes' shape and position relative to one another. Large forces from the atomic force microscopes cut the nanotubes into specific sizes. Based on how the nanotubes are modified, they can be conducting or semiconducting. The processing of nanotubes leads to different properties that affect their function as transistors. Nanotubes can be produced into various cylindrical shapes and orientations along the carbon chains. Using carbon nanotubes as transistors allows current to be transported more efficiently. The strong covalent bonds of the carbon and the nanotube prevent heat loss, which channels the current faster with less energy consumption. This decrease in waste of heat and power allows carbon nanotubes to provide better processing speeds in comparison to silicon transistors. 
Carbon has four valence electrons, so it can make four possible bonds. Graphene has three sp2 sigma bonds in one plane and a pi bond outside the plane. Because the pi orbitals are distributed over the plane, it's relatively easy for their electrons to leave their places, which leads to electrical conductivity. The carbon nanotube is similar to a graphite sheet rolled into a tube, so its properties are very similar, and it's also conductive. Because of its cylindrical geometry, the orbitals are slightly rearranged, and the pi orbital is less localized than it is in graphene. Therefore, carbon nanotubes are more conductive. For a transistor, we want a material that has a high conductivity while still being a semiconductor, so this is a good thing. Carbon nanotubes can be either metallic or semiconducting, depending on the way they're rolled. There are three different ways, called armchair, zigzag, and chiral. Armchair nanotubes are metallic. This would be bad for a transistor because it would no longer function as a switch, so they have to be removed. The other nanotubes are semiconductors. For semiconducting carbon nanotubes, the band gap for a one nanometer diameter comes out to be about 0.7 to 0.9 electrovolts. For comparison, the band gap of silicon is about 1.1 electrovolts. This smaller band gap means that carbon nanotubes can act more efficiently than silicon while still being a semiconductor. There are also a few ways to dope carbon nanotubes to make them N or P type. First, you could add impurities by replacing the carbon with nitrogen, for example. This works similarly to how it does in silicon. Second, you can add positive or negative ions between the bundles of carbon nanotubes. And third, you can also bond atoms or compounds to the outside of the tubes. Carbon nanotubes are more efficient and effective than silicon transistors. By fully incorporating them into our electronics, Moore's law will no longer come to an end and technology can continue to improve.